I'm here to talk today about the principles of dark field and phase contrast microscopy. Uh, uh, I want to begin uh, by talking about some experiments that Fritz Zernike described uh, that he did uh, during the process of discovering uh, phase contrast microscopy, for which he received a, a, a Nobel Prize. Uh, 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 these are described in a science article and, and also in a, in a chapter in, in a book in the reference list. And uh, the setup of the microscope uh, uh, that he used in these experiments is shown in, in the diagram here. Uh, it's, it's set up for curler illumination uh, with the f following adjustments. Um, the iris diaphragm on the condenser is uh, closed down to a very small spot and as a result of that, that illuminates through the condenser and produces a, a beam of uh, plane wave illumination of the specimen. And the specimen he initially used in, in the, uh, that he used in these experiments uh, was a uh, very fine carbon particles that were sprinkled on the surface of a cover slip mounted onto a glass slide. And when the plane wave hits this, these fine carbon particles, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, illuminating light just passes by and it's collected by the objective lens and then uh, that illuminating light becomes focused at the objective back focal plane. It's also called the, uh, the back aperture of the objective here and, as a point. And then that light then spreads out from that point and becomes uh, uh, spread and even illumination up here across the uh, uh, image plane, right, right up in there. On the other hand, the, the, the light that, that the specimen scatters or diffracts, which um, right here, uh, is collected by the objective and is focused as a real image up here on the image plane by the microscope objective. And what one sees by eye, if you look in the microscope, is these very fine specks uh, of black carbon particles. Then he did the following experiment. He, he had used an objective that had a special slot in it so that in the back aperture, uh, where the uh, uh, illuminating beam is in focus, he could insert a stop that was either um, uh, um, a, a piece of shim stock with a tiny hole in it that just let the illuminating beam through, or a very fine sliver of shim stock that would block the illuminating beam, but then let the diffracted or scattered light through. And then he looked at the image that was formed under these conditions. And this is shown here on the bottom. So here is the image that's formed without any stops in the back aperture. And you can see the fine uh, black carbon particles. Um, this is the image that he got. If he just let the illuminating beam come through and none of the scattered light, he saw no particles at all. And finally, if he blocked the illuminating beam, then he did see the particles, but now in a, a kind of a, uh, uh, dark field uh, illumination uh, 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 situation in which the particles are now bright white against the black background. Okay, so what Zernike uh, uh, concluded from this is that, that these experiments is that the image, even for absorbing particles like the carbon particles, is formed by interference of the undiffracted light <coughs> with the diffracted light. That blocking the diffracted light results in the loss of the image of the carbon particles and one just sees uniform illumination of the fields as predicted by Abby uh, a number of years ago, and that the image formation is a result of the interference of the diffracted light from the specimen with the undiffracted light at the image plane. And blocking the undiffracted light results in a dark field image generated by interference of the diffraction orders because we've now lost the, the background light, illuminating light that wasn't diffracted. And finally, the interesting part of this uh, that led to face contrast is that absorbing objects appeared to behave like transparent objects that have a wavelength over two, that is uh, retardation, relative to the undiffracted direct light. That means that their, their, their light is a 
180 degrees out of phase and destructively interferes at the image plane to produce the black contrast of the carbon particles. Now, dark field as a microscopy technique is not done the way Zernike did in his experiment. Uh, we want to have some resolution normally in dark field microscopy. Uh, the principle is the same, but one uses condensers that have an annulus of illumination uh, whose numerical aperture, uh, angle of illum illumination, uh, um, uh, the numerical aperture is the refractive index uh, uh, in a specimen times the sign of the angle of illumination. And so you can see that special condensers are used here uh, to generate this high angular illumination. And you want the angle of illumination to produce a hollow co cone of light that's not capable of being accepted by the objective numerical aperture or objective aperture. And as a consequence, one has a dark field. And then the scattered light that's generated by this illumination being focused on the specimen is collected by the objective and then is focused as, as spots in the image plane. Now, the, 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 as I mentioned, this requires a special condenser if you want to do the highest uh, resolution light microscopy. And uh, uh, the, these have uh, special uh, hemisp hemispherical mirrors that reflect the light off to other mirrored surfaces over here on the, on, on the, on the outside of the objective. That, that finally give you this cone of light uh, that's coming out. And, and you can make a numerical aperture of this cone of light almost to, uh, uh, to about 1.3. Uh, and the highest end numerical apertures of our objectives it used to be about 1.4. It's getting higher now, 1.45 to 1.6. Uh, they won't uh, work because they'll collect this cone of light. And so objectives actually use for uh, dark field at at, at, at high, uh, highest resolution have a, a, a diaphragm in their back focal plane so that they can pull it down and, and be, be sure to block the, the illumination, uh, illuminating beam. Now the advantage of the dark field is that it can be, provide high sensitivity and it's possible to see uh, scattered light from very small objects, uh, like 25 nanometer diameter objects. And it's excellent for low magnification outlines of individual cells such as sperm and chlamydomonas and other protozoa that scatter light uh, very, very strongly. And here's an example of a stroboscopic dark field image uh, from a, uh, a time lapse series for a swimming sea urchin sperm where the, they indicated one mark on the flagella during its beat pattern in order to analyze just what the beat pattern looks like. And down below here is a, another time-lapse series from a stroboscopic series at dark field uh, on the beating pattern of the two flagella of chlamydomonas. And, uh, and again, this is uh, in order to, to learn about the actual waveforms and beating of these organelles, uh, dark field microscopy has been very important. Now, it has a lot of disadvantages, though, which means that the NA, and this is because the NA of the condenser is less than the NA objective, you get a limit in the actual resolution that you can get in the, Im in the image. And uh, uh, there's also a lot of scattered light in dark field imaging for any thickness in specimens, which obscures fine structural detail. And uh, it has poor depth of field because the scattered light uh, is carried up the optical axis of the microscope. And images of internal cellular structures are often inaccurate and confusing because you're missing the fidelity that you get by having interference with the undifracted light. And you often need very special, very bright light sources to get enough light to make a good image uh, um, in dark field. So dark field has had limited applications and the discovery of the phase contrast technique had a big impact in, in, in biology because it offered a method to view living cells uh, with a rather simple uh, um, uh, optical method that didn't require such bright light, but in addition would allow you to use the highest resolution numerical aperture objectives that were available. And uh, I show you an example here of one of my squamous uh, cheek cells. And on the left-hand side uh, uh, is uh, uh, the view of this cell as seen uh, 
by fully illuminating the objective aperture uh, uh, with just bright field illumination. And this is the same cell uh, when the, the, the microscope is set up for phase contrast. And so I don't even think you can just barely pick out the nucleus right here in bright field. And here you can see lots of fine structural detail as well as where the nucleus is and some of these dead mitochondria and other things uh, in, in my cheek cell. So how does this done uh, uh, normally? So if we go back to the basic experimental scheme that Zernike used, we want to start here with a plane wave, <coughs> a parallel beam of light that produces a plane wave that hits the specimen. But now our specimen is going to be a transparent specimen uh, not a carbon par sorbing carbon particle, but a transparent specimen that has a refractive index just slightly higher uh, than the background media. And the refractive index, as you will re remember, is a measure of the speed of light. Uh, uh, the higher the refractive index, the slower is the speed of light. And uh, this, this is going to be a very thin specimen, so it, although it has a higher refractive index than the background, uh, it, it light will move, it won't be very thick in, in, in this experiment. And so the beam, our, our illuminating beam hits this specimen, and, and uh, as before, the illumination light becomes focused at the back focal plane of the, uh, um, of the microscope right, right here. Uh, and then becomes spread out at the image plane. And the scattered light, which isn't very much, from the, uh, this transparent specimen, there's still scattered light, is collected by the objective, and then be, a real image is, becomes in focus up here at, at the image plane. So, um, so here's uh, uh, what happens to our illuminating wavefront. If we look uh, right at the uh, uh, wave front, just as it's coming into the specimen, we have a plane wave front in this setup. And here's our little specimen here of refractive index uh, that's larger than the background. It has a thickness T. And if we look at the wave front just after it passes through the specimen, you can see that the wave front has been retarded in space relative to the surrounding media because of the higher refractive index producing a slower velocity of light moving through the specimen. And, and for an example, you can take an organelle that has a refractive index of uh, uh, maybe 1.4 and the cytosol is 1.36 here, all right? And if the thickness is one micron, then, then this retardation uh, produced by the specimen is actually quite small. It's, 0.04 nanometers, which is uh, about a thirteenth of the wavelength of a green light. So it's very small. And uh, the retardation is calculated as the thickness times the retardation of the specimen here minus the retardation of, of the media. So we have a very small retardation uh, of the wavefront. Now that wavefront is then imaged at the image plane and that imaging that's taking place there uh, is uh, the consequence of, uh, uh, produces a, a wavefront that's a magnified image by the objective of that wavefront just after the specimen. And so we have the undifracted light <coughs> uh, in the background being here. We have the, the light that passed through the specimen being retarded here. And Based on the idea that the specimen light is generated by the interference between the diffracted light and the undiffracted light, right? if you subtract this from that, one gets the diffracted light. And what Zernike realized is that the diffracted light coming from a thin transparent specimen is approximately a quarter wavelength out of phase with the undiffracted light. Uh, hitting the specimen, and is a, not of sufficient amplitude to make much difference in the amplitude of the specimen uh, uh, at, at the image plane. What we have here is Zernike's solution for phase contrast using that quarter wavelength information about thin uh, 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 
transparent specimens for the diffracted light. So he set up, he made a circular uh, uh, glass uh, disc in which in the center he, he uh, uh, milled or, 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 or ground or wh however he did it, uh, uh, an ind indentation that made this part of the plate thinner so that for the undiffracted light coming through the objective back focal plane at this place here, right, it received a quarter wavelength less retardation than for the scattered or diffracted light that is unfocused at this point in the back focal plane. And the sum of those two would be produce the half wavelength he want, needed in order to get destructive interference contrast at the image plane. And in order to bring the intensity of the undiffracted light down to match the intensity or to come close to the intensity of the uh, weak intensity of the, of the diffracted light, uh, this, this uh, uh, hole here was also coated uh, with a material that attenuated the uh, 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 intensity of the illuminating light beam uh, uh, um, approximately uh, uh, oh, 75% or so uh, of what its normal level is. And as a, as a result, at the image plane, we now get uh, 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 the interference of the uh, uh, <coughs> diffracted light, the, un the undiffracted light, uh, uh, with the diffracted light, and because they're now uh, a, a half wavelength or 180 degrees out of phase, this produces a, a dark contrast uh, for the transparent specimen that you saw in our example of my, my cheek cell. See? So, pretty simple. Now, the problem with the Zernike test system is that there is no numerical aperture in the illumination from the condenser. And as you probably have learned, the uh, resolution in transmitted light microscopy is equal to uh, uh, the wavelength of light divided by the, the uh, numerical aperture uh, uh, times point. F uh, <coughs> The wavelength of light divided by the numerical aperture of the objective plus the numerical aperture of the condenser. So in his system, he was only getting the resolution uh, that, that, that was produced by the numerical aperture of the objective. And in, in, in phase contrast microscopy, the way it's implemented now in modern lenses is to use an annular, uh, uh, an annulus of illumination in the condenser so that we have an annular cone of light that illuminates the specimen. That cone of light is collected by the objective and passes through this phase, what's called the phase plate, that's in the back focal plane or back aperture of the objective. And it's a ring now instead of a spot, right? And then the, the light coming through this ring, the uh, illuminating beam, then spreads out up here on the ceiling where the image plane is at the same point where the uh, uh, specimen uh, diffracted light image uh, comes into focus, right? So uh, the, the diameter of this annulus here of illumination and uh, the diameter of the phase ring is typically chosen to be about a half of the uh, 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 aperture of the objective, which means the illumination from the condenser is about half of the numerical aperture uh, of the objective. Now, if I take a out the ocular in the microscope and put a telescope in so I can form focus on the objective back focal plane, I can see for a phase contrast objective uh, the periphery over here of the ob objective aperture. And actually, the objective aperture may be a little further out than this because this is the this is the as much as my condenser. Uh, which has a lower NA than the objective is able to illuminate that aperture. But then right here is the phase ring and we see it uh, uh, illuminated, uh, we see it in the objective back focal plane because it's absorbing light uh, 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 for the, the illumination light that goes through it in order to attenuate that light. So that's the phase ring. And so all phase contrast objectives have this phase ring built into the objective uh, uh, at their back focal plane or back aperture. 
Now, in alignment for phase contrast, uh, we mentioned before that the phase ring diameter is about 50% of the numerical aperture of the objective, so that the condenser in combination with the, the uh, phase annulus have to produce the proper cone of light with the right numerical aperture in order to become in that cone to become in focused at the position where the phase ring is in the objective aperture. And so the uh, uh, condenser annulus diameter must be chosen for a particular uh, condenser lens uh, to, to produce that correct uh, uh, cone, cone of illumination. And phase objectives are classified as phase one, two, three, and four as they go to higher numerical apertures, or it's now uh, pH one, two, three, and four indicating matching condenser annuli uh, um, to be labeled on them. Uh, and and uh, the, the condenser annulus must be aligned with a phase ring, and there's usually adjustment screws that uh, allow this to take place. So here's an inverted microscope that we use uh, for, uh, often for uh, tissue culture microinjection. Um, here's the holder for uh, a needle for microinjecting tissue culture cells. And we observe those cells using phase contrast. And in this case, it's a long working distance uh, condenser lens. And then I'm, I'm at the <clears throat> front focal plane of the condenser lens is this turret. And the turret has, uh, uh, can be rotated. And it has uh, um, uh, um, openings uh, for, I think, three different phase uh, annulus, a uh, annuli as well as one condenser diaphragm if you want to just use full bright field uh, illumination. These screws here on the microscope are used to center the condenser lens properly, which is used to adjust the microscope for Kähler illumination and to center the image of the field diaphragm. There's also screws uh, that you use with an Allen wrench uh, to center each of the uh, uh, annuluses that are inside the turret here. And I think I have a picture of what that looks like. So if you take, the, take this off and look at it, this is the, op this is the position of the, of, the, of the wheel that contains the diaphragm. And then uh, this is the, the uh, phase three position here. And then this is over here is the, is the phase two. And then down over here is the phase one. Notice as we go to, uh, this is the higher NA, and this is the lower NA, and you can see for the same condenser lens how much bigger the diameter, whoops, of the higher NA annulus has to be to match the 50% of the numerical aperture of the high NA objective compared to the, that for the low NA objective, see? So that you have to choose the correct one. And by the way, if you switch condensers and go to a high NA condenser, there will be a different annulus for that high NA condenser than the one you use for the low NA condenser, right? And so you need to just make sure with the manufacturer that you have them color coded properly or something like that. Now here's the alignment problem. And, and, and so if, if you look as we did before with a telescope at the objective back aperture and we have no annulus, we can see the phase ring. And I just sort of drew a line where I roughly think maybe the actual periphery of the objective aperture is. It's maybe here, right? And then if we have an annulus, but it's misaligned, you can see that, that, that light is now coming through uh, the aperture uh, in regions that don't have the phase ring, so it, the, the light isn't being attenuated, nor is it being uh, 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 properly uh, uh, phase advanced relative to the diffracted light. And then down here, we've, uh, with this one down, way down here at the bottom, uh, um, uh, uh, now we have the, uh, uh, the ring centered properly and passing totally contained within the, uh, the annulus, is, image of the annulus is totally contained within the ring of the objective and you will get a proper image. So, so here we have uh, no, no phase, phase annulus at all, which is our, our, our bright field image. Uh, here we have a misaligned annulus, and ugly picture, and now we have an aligned annulus, and we get a really nice picture. So 
Once you get phase contrast lined up on the microscope, you usually don't have to ever change the alignment and you just simply have to switch the objectives and switch the turrets to making sure that everybody's lined up and matched. Now, th this is a plot that, that they, they do for microscope optics. So essentially the, the, um, the contrast that can be generated uh, as a function of the uh, 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 resolution or maximal spatial frequency uh, that can be resolved by an objective uh, condenser combination. And for this, 100 is the maximum resolution for this particular objective. And if you had bright field illumination, this is the potential contrast, this solid line curve here, that you would get where the, where the numerical aperture of condenser illumination is equal to the numerical aperture of the objective illumination. Now for that same objective, in phase contrast, the contrast curve is this green line, and you can see that it, it, it peaks um, uh, at a lower spatial frequency or a lower resolution, and then maximizes out down here uh, at about 75% of what you could get in and a fully illuminated objective aperture if you had the contrast there to see it, right? And that's, this is because, in fact, the, the, the uh, um, condenser numerical aperture is typically 50% of the objective numerical aperture, so you don't really expect to get much above 75%. So, so that's a kind of formal way, and so things tend to be more highlighted in phase contrast that aren't quite as uh, fine in structure uh, as what might, you might consider to be the limit of resolution of a particular um, uh, microscope objective. Besides not being able to achieve the maximum resolution that uh, the uh, objective numerical aperture will allow you, the other problem with, with uh, um, phase contrast is that uh, the phase ring is, is, is larger than uh, the than the uh, phase annular of illumination, as, and as a result, uh, uh, lower low angle diffracted light, uh, which contains information about low spatial frequencies in the specimen, is attenuated by the phase ring and, and doesn't get to the image plane. And this produces halos around uh, phase objects like, like the nucleus here. And in thicker specimens, those halos propagate up and down through the specimen and cause confusion, much like, like in dark field. Phase contrast imaging is one of the more popular uh, op optical modes in, in cell biology because once you have your microscopes aligned properly, it's relatively easy to use and it, it, it provides a, 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 its impact has been great uh, 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 because it in particular allows you to look at dynamic behavior of, of movements in cells uh, that aren't too thick, and in this case, this is an example I have here is a mitotic uh, uh, PTK1 cell, which is an epithelial cell in, in mitosis, and uh, we, this is part of a time-lapse uh, movie, um, and uh, these are the chromosomes of which they're 12 or 13, depending on whether it's male or female, and uh, the mitotic spindle forms between the spindle poles, one is here, and another one is up here. And so this cell is just entered into prometaphase, and the movie will show you from prometaphase the alignment on the metaphase plate, and then in anaphase, and then into cytokinesis. The worm-like structures up here in the cytoplasm are mitochondria, and, and then the periphery of the cell, here's one edge here, and you can see the other edge down here, and so forth. And uh, when we do time-lapse imaging, uh, we typically use a 100 watt um, quartz halogen illuminator, standard uh, white light illuminator, and then a good heat reflection filter and a wide band green uh, light filter with high transmission efficiency. And the cells, uh, th this illumination uh, virtually uh, can be, uh, we can film the cells for long periods of time uh, without any damage to the cells. So here we go. 
So here's metaphase, and then we're into antiphase, and then we're into cytokinesis. Yeah. Okay, so this could be routinely used to uh, screen uh, siRNA knockdowns or other things like that in terms of how they affect chromosome movement or spindle assembly or, 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 or what have you fairly easily. Uh, the, the other thing about phase contrast uh, that's been particularly useful uh, is that uh, it is convenient to combine with epifluorescence microscopy so that you can use the uh, major advantages of fluorescence um, and particularly for genetically encoded uh, fluorophores like GFP and its relatives uh, to uh, uh, view the locations of specific proteins and then use phase contrast to see where the, those locations are relative to uh, the structural dynamics of cells. And um, the convenience comes from the fact that you, all you need is two, two shutters, uh, one shutter to uh, open and close uh, transillumination and the other shutter to open and close epiillumination. And in, in the illumination that you use for phase contrast, you use the same color light as the, as the fluorescence emitted light, so that uh, you need a filter there that matches the fluorescence emitted light. And so you just have to, uh, every time you, uh, let's say, take time-lapse pictures, you first take a phase picture and then uh, open the shutter and close it, and then, then open the fluorescence shutter and close it, and, 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 and uh, then wait your delay and then take the next one and the next one and the next one. So. So the, the downside is that that phase ring absorbs about 15% of the fluorescence light. And so if, you're, if your fluorescence objects are really weak, it, that can be a little bit of trouble. And the uh, phase ring slightly spreads out the airy disk, reducing slightly the resolution that you get in, in fluorescence. But for many applications, that's not really very severe. So for this inverted scope, uh, which is a different one, uh, we have the shutter up here for the transillumination, and then we have the shutter right here for the epiillumination, and then we've selected the filter for GFP that's in here, and then up here we have both the heat reflection, plus we have the, a, a green filter for the 5, 10 nanometer emission that comes from the GFP, and then that we use to make this movie here, which is again a PTK cell and mitosis, but this cell is now expressing uh, a uh, GFP fused to a kinetochore protein called CDC20. And so you can see the kinetochore is marked uh, with the green fluorescence of CDC20. And you can see the, the, the cell outlines and, and the chromosomes uh, 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 by phase contrast. And we've pseudocolored this movie so that the phase contrast image is generated, is in the red channel and the GFP images in the green channel. And so here it goes. This cell is almost in metaphase, and what it highlights is the oscillatory nature of kinetochore motility uh, when aligned at metaphase. Kinetochores can switch back and forth between polymerizing and depolymerizing their kinetochore microtubules, and then in anaphase, they depolymerize them, and that helps carry chromosomes to the poles. And so that can be used as an assay for studying proteins that are involved in that, that force-generating mechanism for, for, for chromosome movements. 